The Unshackled Waves, episode 257. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, welcome to another Waves episode. In the hyper-partisan current year with the left and right at each other's throats, both politically and out on the streets, there's been one political group which has been left behind and is confused about how to handle the, the current state of politics. The modern libertarian movement grew out of a war-weary United States in 2008, at the same time the global financial crisis hit and a lot of people were wondering how did this happen? This was when small government, non-interventionist Republican Congressman Ron Paul ran for president. He ran again for president in 2012 when the Tea Party had popularized the values of limited constitutional government. But the election cycle of 2016 saw the libertarian movement marginalized and its message filtered out. The new major party nominees, Donald Trump, and Hillary Clinton ran on a platform that were very antithetical to liberty. The Trump presidency has divided libertarians. Some go as far to, as to call him the embodiment of modern day fascism. Others take a more measured approach and claim Trump has overseen the introduction of nationalist conservatism with a reduced role for the free market. There are those like me who view Trump as a disruptor, the political establishment and the deep state, which is exactly what has been needed. Others say that the state of liberty has has largely been unchanged under Trump and politicians like before have not delimited on their smaller government and the reform that they promised. So what is the state of the libertarian movement in 2019 and what can be done to achieve meaningful steps to liberty in the current political climate? That is what I'll be discussing today with my guest Stephen Clyde who runs the Peace and Liberty podcast. Stephen, welcome to the show. Same with pleasure. Thank you, man. Now you and I are roughly uh, the same age and it's fair to say probably both of us came to the modern libertarian movement through congressman ron paul during his he first ran for president in in 2008 when the united states and i think the the world was quite war worry and mm -hmm. while the, the the mainstream media and uh, a lot of the the political intelligentsia were attracted to obama as a candidate he wasn't changing much in terms of foreign wars but ron paul was coming in and saying no we need to get out of all these foreign wars and he was advocating smaller government and i think it, it was put well by uh scott horton who said that ron paul proved you didn't need to be a pinko commie to be anti-war and he really opened up people's eyes about thinking outside as tom woods calls the three by five card oh absolutely i mean i Oh, I could take this so many different directions. One thing I'll just say about Ron Paul, he's the most human guy you can ever see on TV. I mean, you know, when I listen to like Rand Paul, he has a lot of human moments, but he also has his politician moments. And same with almost every, every, anyone else, Thomas Massey, whoever. Um, with Ron Paul, it's just, I, I never once thought, man, he sounds like a politician up there. I just never ever once thought that about him. And I'm, I'm sure most people feel the same way. So I don't know, maybe I should back up a little bit on um, my really got into all this when I was about 17. Um, I, so I, I got my GED early out of high school and I went to community college. And my first semester I had a sociology class, I had an English class, point being my professors were all Marxist. So I, when you're in that kind of environment with young impressionable kids, I think kind of the um, direction you get pulled is toward the left because it's like, it's compassionate, it's nice. You know, I, I don't really have to go out and do anything for anybody, I just have to like, see all these nice things, make sure people think I'm not racist, all, all stuff. Um, and also at the time, I, I smoked pot. I smoked pot since I was like 16. And then all of a sudden, one day this guy comes on the screen and he's like, we should legalize all drugs. And I think I like jumped out of my seat like, what? Is, is he serious? Like, you know, I, I think um, I, I knew friends who were getting in trouble for like an eighth of weed, a gram of weed. It's just, it, it seems ridiculous now. But, um, you know, I was pretty much run of the mill, fine Ron Paul because you smoke weed. But then I just really started to listen. So I came from a neoconservative family, and it was very common for me to hear things like, um, you know, screw the Middle East, we should just blow them off the map. Problem done. Problem solved. And I did, that's the kind of thing you hear in neoconservative families. It's just, you know, these people are disposable, they're our enemies, they, they hate us for our freedom, right? 
when I started listening to Ron Paul, I'm just hearing all these new ideas for the first time. Totally with him on the drugs. Totally with him on the limit government. And then he's saying things like Austrian economics and business cycles and printing money and just everything that no one else is talking about. And then he gets the foreign policy, and that's where I really had to step back. Like, hold on, I, I, I like this guy so much, but why is he saying all this crazy stuff? Like, you know, don't we have to protect Israel relentlessly? Don't we have to make sure we go to war with Iran? I mean, this is just kind of like how neoconservatives think. They don't think. So uh, marijuana was a, a gateway drug to, to libertarianism. Oh, yeah. I, I, think, wonder... I think for many it is. <laughs> So, so probably the, the neoconservatives these days probably put that out as PSA. You know, I think honestly the conservatives have gone way, I don't know if you want to say left, they, they've definitely become more comfortable with the idea of, you know, legalizing weed, gay marriage. You know, people always say uh, Trump's this anti-LGBT guy. I don't think he is. I, I'm pretty sure he was like pro-LGBT and like pro-gay marriage and stuff like that. So, oh, well, we'll stick with Ron Paul for the moment. And you mentioned the, the drug war, which... In the United States, it's it's really policed rigorously. You have the the SWAT teams going into people's houses. You have people locked up for non-violent drug offences. In Australia, drugs are illegal, but police use a lot of discretion. It's 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 normally not the case that if you're caught with small amount of marijuana, your life is is ruined. But that was a big aspect of Ron Paul's uh, manifesto as well. And of course, 2008 was the financial crisis where people were saying, how did, how did this happen? And Ron Paul was, that, that's, that's why people listen to him. Like this is because of the business cycle. He spoke about Austrian economics. Normally people are attracted to a certain philosophy if it offers a explanation and solution. And Ron Paul was doing that in and an easy solution. That. People want easy solutions. You know, I'm not a big fan of Trump, but at the same time, I understand that people in general are very simple minded. They want one person to blame. So if something happens in Syria, something happens in North Korea or whatever it is. People feel more comfortable pointing the finger at one person versus having to go and do a research, which takes time and effort to form a more, I don't know, sane conclusion. But they don't do that. People like really, really simplistic answers to everything. And that's why politics is such a mess. You have the Republicans and Democrats and they have all these solutions for us. As long as we get them in power, like they're going to be the ones uh, to give, our, give us back our freedom. It's totally insane. Uh, obviously, that's not going to happen. Um, I guess I'll also throw in here. I, I was always one of the, I, I'm an anarchist. I'm, I'm wearing my anarchist shirt. And I was always one of those guys that thought, you know, I'm, I don't believe in voting. Voting is violence. And I, I, for the most part, still believe that. But I work with uh, the, Bees, the Mises Caucus of the Libertarian Party. And I don't want to toot our, toot our horn too much, but, you know, we're really doing something special. What we're really trying to do is just uh, forget the party. We're trying to revitalize the Ron Paul revolution. What the hell happened to those days? Those days were amazing. And it just slipped by and then Bernie Sanders came along and we lost a lot of people to, to him. Um, we're just trying to revitalize that because, you know, you'll hear, you'll hear Ron Paul talk about this a lot. That uh, what, an, an idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. But the flip side of that is... Once ideas die, they're very hard to revive. Very hard to revive. I mean, sure, we might lose everything and maybe we'll pick libertarianism back up in 20, year 2100, but who knows? So it's, you know, from my point of view, it's like, we got to do this right now. We got to spread the message right now. We don't have 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, Social Security is going to be bankrupt very soon. Even the most leftist economists admit that. And just we could just go on and on and on about all the problems uh, looking forward, going forward. I guess I should explain to our Australian audi audience that because anarchist, it has a negative connotation here because basically the Antifa and Marxist groups have co-opted oh, yeah. that term themselves. And so in my city of Melbourne there, they're out on the street often protesting about various things, uh, right. refugees. Ludwig von Mises was the same way. I mean, anarchist to him meant like left anarchist. It's just the time period he grew up in. And we're still slipping away from that. I think we're at the point where... People at least know what you're saying. If you say you're an anarcho-capitalist, like the ANCOMs would be like, oh, okay, I know who you are. I hate you. But I imagine before, like, Murray Rothbard was really the guy that, like, put this all together, him and Hoppe. And that didn't happen really until, like, the, the 70s and 80s. Well, really in the 60s, but you know, going forward in the 70s and 80s, that's really when anarcho-capitalism was born. But I totally understand. Yeah, anarchist has that connotation with it that's like, uh, are you an Antifa? Are you going to wear a mask? You know, you're going to buy, buy a cup of Starbucks and break the windows of Starbucks? I mean, yeah. who knows? I, I get it. I, I totally get that. And um, I'm always comfortable telling people I'm an anarchist, but I do explain. 
not a commie. <laughs> now, after Obama was elected and he had this huge big government program and you know, the stimulus and it all failed, there was, of course, a massive backlash from the Republicans and conservatives at the time who, in my opinion, all of a sudden realized the value of small government. It's sort of it's right. when they're when they're not in power, the Republicans are like yeah, small constitutional, limited government, balanced budgets, free enterprise. Well, when they are, you get Patriot Act, you get multiple wars, yeah. you get deficit spending, like everything. Every single thing they say they're going to do, they do the opposite. I'll, I'll give Trump the benefit of the doubt in saying like he has kept a lot of his quote unquote promises, but at the same time, like I said, people want to point the finger at one guy. So no matter anything good or bad that happens, is Trump's fault, right? So uh, it's it's just how very simplistic minded Americans are in general. I can't speak for Australians or Europeans or anyone else. I can speak for Americans. We're pretty dumb on average, at least politically. Very, very politically uh, illiterate, if you want to call it that. So the Tea Party was born and Ron Paul was, was seen as the, the grandfather of it because he'd been talking about limited constitutional government and the value of free enterprise for years. And so he did another presidential run in, in 2012 and did a, a whole lot better. He came fourth overall and was able to take that momentum from 2008 to 2012 and keep the, the, the movement together. So it basically looked like this libertarian moment, as it called, was, was unstoppable. And there was, including right. me, like I was optimistic by 2016, we could get a libertarian as the, the Republican candidate. Yeah, that's one of those things where you start to become like the people who are around you. So if everybody around you is saying, man, those, those damn libertarians, ha, they're just going to go to the elections and get 3% again. What a waste. Gary Johnson, what is Aleppo? I mean, if that's all you're hearing around you, yeah, why wouldn't you, why, why, why wouldn't you lose hope? Because it doesn't seem like anyone else is hopeful. You know, hope, is, hope isn't a one-way street. You need everybody to be hopeful for there to be real hope. Can't, can't be just me or just you. You know, reflecting on the Ron Paul days, it's almost like, what the hell happened? There was so much momentum and just, I don't know if it was like, I think it was just right when Obama started passing all this big legislation. He passed uh, Obamacare. It, it was something crazy. It's like in 2016, I think Obama dropped, the Obama administration dropped like a bomb every 20 minutes for all of 2016. Can you just imagine? And we could just go on and on and on. I mean, all Obama did was ramp up what George W. Bush did. It's not like he really undid anything. Yeah, you got the health care, but in general, he ramped up the Patriot Act. I'm sure you know what the Patriot Act is. Yeah. I know you're from Australia, but yeah, I mean, it's... It's, it's totally crazy. Uh, short story, um, my dad's an electronic engineer for uh, Boeing, and this was about 15 years ago. He would always tell me when I was a kid, like, Steve, be careful what you say on the phone. They're listening. And it's not so much that they're listening, listening, but they have filters where, you know, imagine you say the word bomb. Well, you say the word bomb on the phone, that's, you get put into some system, and they start analyzing you. It's just that, that's how the rabbit hole goes. And he was telling me this stuff 15, 20 years ago. You know the technology they have nowadays, Tim? They can unlock your they can unlock your iPhone and just look at you through your camera. Every all the lights off. I'll tell you one really really creepy one, and I'm sure you've heard about this. Where if you have like Ask Siri on, where you can be like Ask uh, Hey Siri and it'll pop up automatically. Well, for it to be able to be in that mode, it has to be constantly listening. So for example, let's say I'm talking about like sushi. I really want to try this sushi place. Wow, go on Google. What's, what do you think that first ad was? And it's not, it, Tim, it's not a coincidence. This is how it works. They listen to you. They figure out your lifestyle. They figure out patterns. Where do you go to eat? What do, you, what, what do they think you'll like? And they advertise to you. And inevitably, it feels kind of nice. Like, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Wow. Well, think about how creepy that really is. And think about all the other stuff they're listening to. I mean, I almost don't, don't, just don't even care anymore because I feel so bad for the suckers that are overlooking the poor and I'm watching or whatever it may be it just those poor suckers man they, they, they must be so bored like they just can't get anything out of me <laughs> of course it's not just big government listening in and watching it's it's big tech now that we're we're finding out and it's interesting now that big government is now threatened by the power of big tech google and facebook and are dragging them before congress and issuing these fines and <laughs> it's just funny this sort of new ultra power struggle well, you know, here's a good segue into this. Um, just talking about the word monopoly. What is monopoly? Well, if you ask the modern day leftists, they'll tell you that a monopoly is just a really, really big firm that has all this power. It's like, well, of course, Elizabeth Warren would say something like that. Monopolies traditionally always meant, going centuries back, uh, a monopoly is exclusive rights 
or privileges granted by the government to an entity or a person or a business or whatever. Meaning that uh, if, if I produce desks and I get the exclusive right to do that, yeah, I have a monopoly on that. A monopoly is not just some big firm. So you're absolutely right that big tech and big government, they've been in bed together the whole time. It's just, um, you know, we're pro-capitalist, so we don't necessarily want to go directly for the attack on Walmart because, you know, Walmart provides a lot of cheap uh, goods and services to poor people. And that I like. They get, they get millions and billions of dollars of subsidies. That I don't like. So it's a little bit tricky. But in general, yeah, I mean, they're all in bed together. And it's pretty much if you're a rich person with money, you go to the politician, you pay him some money, and you get a law passed. And that's how people solve their problems. They pass a law. Now, in my opinion, things began to change and the, the fracturing of the, the libertarian movement began in, in 2015, where basically the social justice warriors, they started taking over the University of Missouri, where all of a sudden they decided that their, their university was racist and, and not... In, not in Missouri too, that's just hilarious. Not, not catering to minorities and were making all these demands of the, of the faculty. Police in the United States, they, they just seemed to shoot anybody and of course if you look at the the crime statistics that's african americans are uh, overrepresented so it appeared like they were they were targeting well, it, it, it's, it's tricky it's it's like yeah they are killed at a much higher rate if you're just looking at the aggregate it's on average like 400 white people you know 100 200 black people so aggregate wise white people get killed more but rate wise yeah they're definitely killing minorities way more and again it's conflicting i don't like a lot of the I don't like a lot of the things that Black Lives Matter does, just like, you know, harassing people and like, you know, every, everybody's racist if they're, if they're white and blah, blah, blah. At the same time, there is very real police brutality that happens every day and I see it every day and it's sick. Um, I don't know if you ever watch like Cop Block or any of that, like, it is real. So you got these two uh, forces going against one another and it's like, which way do you want to lean? I don't know. I'm just against government and I don't, I don't really see the easy answer. But that's why I'm an anarchist. I don't have the answers. I don't know how to control your life, and I don't know the legislation we need, and neither does anyone else. <laughs> uh, so then it was presidential primary season, and the Democrats, they hadn't improved at all. I mean, Hillary Clinton was the, the establishment candidate. Uh, she was for all the wars, all the, all the crony capitalism, and well, Bernie Sanders had been around forever. He was a democratic mm -hmm. socialist and just basically didn't understand economics and you had what, nearly still, every, still doesn't <laughs> every major republican run for for the nomination and i was urging libertarians i'm not sure about you to get behind Rand paul uh, even though he you know wasn't as pure as he as his father he was still still the best hope but of course there, there was a lot of puritans who, who were like oh why should i give up my time for this guy who sold out on these aspects of foreign policy you know uh, rand's just the kind of guy that he pulls in your heartstrings he's really 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 good one day and another day is just like you know what are you doing man what are you doing and then like the next day is like oh that's fucking awesome i love rand you know he's just one of those guys that kind of pulls you back and forth and like i never felt that way about ron i hate i hate to compare him because i know they actually don't like to be compared to each other you know ron's like you know rand is his own man Rand's like, you know, Ron's my dad, he's his own guy, and they don't like to be compared, so I get why Rand's not trying to be a carbon copy of his dad, but it'd be nice, you know, uh, I was recently just at the Mises Institute for the week-long Mises University, and Judge Napolitano's there, now I'm sure you know, do you know Judge Napolitano? Yeah, 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 That's, uh, yeah I watched a lot of Fox News. He's an amazing guy, but if you watch him on Fox News, just keep in mind, yeah, he's on Fox News, he's, uh, he's required to say certain things. Which is why, like, um, at the Mises Institute, um, I did, like, a week-long constitutional law course. It was amazing. We talked about the Declaration. We talked about the Constitution. We talked about, like, 26 different uh, Supreme Court cases that really led to the demise of our liberties. But he's a little more open in that classroom because it's not on camera. It, could, it, it couldn't be on camera because I'm not saying he trashed Fox, but he's just like, man, if I said that on Fox, man, I'd be fired. It's, it's true. <laughs> so, like, you see, like, this TV persona guy. And then there's the real, the real Judge Knapp, and the real Judge Knapp's such a nice guy. He's so nice. He's so smart. Um, he, he really likes talking to people. And, you know, you'll, you might meet some of your mentors throughout your life, and you'll find that not all of them are as joyful as they seem in podcasts. You know, some people are pretty standoffish in person. Uh, Tom Woods is a good friend, but when you meet him in person, he, I wouldn't say he's standoffish, but you can tell like, I get sick of people hounding him. And I wouldn't call myself a celebritarian, but a lot of people know me. 
I, I fear getting to that point where like, man, it's just like, I can't get a, can't get a break. Can't get a rest because everybody's bogging me. I, I, I know it does get the people. I don't know. It's politics is a crazy fucking world, man. Because everybody thinks they know what they want, but they don't. Oh, in the United States, there's 330 million now. So even though Tom Woods and yourself are still considered quite obscure by by the mainstream media, you still have a major following pop population wise. Oh, I'm so blessed to have all the friends I have. I mean, I. Literally have I mean, I've met thousands and thousands of people to the point where like people come up to me and they're like, hey, dude, how you been? I haven't seen you in a while. I'm like, what's your name again? Or, you, you know, Michael Malice actually taught me a trick. This is actually really good. So imagine you walk up to somebody and you, you honestly forget their name. Just be like, hey, man, what's your name? And they'll be like, Dave. No, no, no. What's your last name? It's a really good trick. Remember yeah. that. Nice. Yeah. It was clear early in the primary season that Rand Paul wasn't going to win the nomination. Uh, he re got relegated to what was termed the, the Kitty second uh, debate. And Ted Cruz was considered the, the most ideologically similar candidate to him. But Ted Cruz, when he was running as a candidate, he was he turned into a massive neocon, you know, wanting to uh, uh, to take it up to uh, Iran. And then, and then you had Trump, who was not a, a libertarian at all, but he was wrecking the, the political establishment. And that's that's why I liked him so much. And just saying all these yeah. outrageous, outrageous things and offending, offending people. There was, of course, the, the Stop Trump movement, the Never Trump movement. It was yeah. just like, wow, they're, they're, these establishment people, they're, they're, they're really scared. And it was just a great spectacle to watch, even though he wasn't a libertarian, he was doing what us libertarians would like to do to the system. I mean, he's he's just a troll, man. Mm. I mean, you know, I, I definitely lean more, if I had to say, I definitely lean more to the right than I do the left. It just in like, you know, if I was talking to two random people, I would get along so much better with the person on the right, hands down. The person on the right's gonna at least understand like half, 75% of what I'm saying. The person on the left just usually doesn't hear me at all, no matter what I'm saying. Even if I'm just using their arguments against them, they just don't hear you. That's the biggest problem, I think, nowadays. It's not so much that our our ideas aren't the correct ideas or that we don't have good arguments. It's just that people need to listen first. That's that's always the first step. You know, I try to talk to new people who I know they're not on board. I try to convince them in their mind that I'm actually on their side first. And then from there they're listening and then they're like, Hold on, you just you're against government? Well, I thought you were I thought you were saying this, but you know, keep going, I'm listening. And it gets to that point. So, you know, I, I was I was a young man too, and I, I used to go out and start random fights with people on Facebook and Man, if I just went back and took like five, ten minutes, uh, pre at least pretended to understand where they're coming from, would have made a lot more progress. You know, speaking of Rand and Ron Paul, um, I don't know if you remember this. I remember it clearly. So imagine it must have been like Fox News or CNN, one of those uh, TV channels. They show all the polls of who's leading in the polls. First slide comes up, Ron Paul's there at the top. I kid you not. The screen faded out and it came back in and Ron Paul wasn't even on there anymore. <laughs> some technical error i can't even laugh it's just that's literally how it is and you know the crazy thing about the media think about this all the stuff with jeffrey epstein but what ended up taking over the news all oh, the new face app thing that makes your face look old oh and area 51 i mean it's all storm, it's, storm yeah, area 51 it's all, it's all very very calculated you don't think that's calculated they know how to get rid of media um, media stories like that mm. remember the lot remember the las vegas massacre when like 500 people got shot or something that shit was gone from the news in like a week or two, man. You just never heard about it. And then like months months later, they said they can't, some, something like they couldn't conclude their investigation. They didn't know why Stephen Paddock did, uh, committed those murders. They have no idea. I mean, Jesus Christ. They just completely try to control our minds. Another thing, Tim, when I, when I first traveled to Mexico, wow, what a culture shock. Just how poor, the, how poor they live there. And just, they still have a lot of pride living there. But getting out of the country, I started to, you take a step outside and you're like, okay, that's what Americans act like. It, but it's, it's difficult because some people have never left their home country. So everyone that's around them, that's like, that's what people are like. And you go to Mexico and different places and you just culture shock. I think that's another problem. A lot of people have never traveled in their life. And, you know, why are there racist and xenophobic, xenophobic people? I don't know. I, I, part, part of it's just, you know, what are you brought up uh, to believe? And another part of it is who are you surrounded by? you try to go meet new people, et cetera. And this all does apply to libertarianism because 
man, I hate to call libertarians autistic. I don't want to use that that word in like a derogatory way. There are people with autism, but you know, libertarians can be the most antisocial people ever, ever. Because when we're in a room with people that we know they don't agree with us, you know, we're in a position where we could take a risk, try to convince them. Uh, the flip side of that is you might get called a Nazi. You, they might try to expel you from school. They might make up something. Um, fake rape stories happen all the time, which detracts from real rape cases. I mean, just all this stuff happens at once. They have all these tactics, and it, it, the decision's always going to lean left. You know, you, you, think, uh, you think if um, a person came up to me in my college, you call me a cracker, like, that would get them expelled? No, they would just be like, in, in essence, it would just be like, you know, you're white. Like, y you have institutional power. Like, you know, people can't be racist against you. That's, that's the argument they actually use that you somehow have institutional power because of your skin. And I don't know, what are they essentially saying? Are they saying that black people and Hispanic people and everyone else, like, oh, they're just, they're just not good enough to have those opinions. It's all the, this entrenched privilege. They accuse us of being conspiracy theorists, but they're the ones who are perpetrating like, no, there's this secret subliminal racism, which is pervading our society and this is what alarmed me about the social justice warriors because i'm not sure about you but i'd been brought up in school that you know racism it's a thing of the past it was horrible but we overcame and you like to, you'd like to think so but you'd like to think so but who keeps the conversation going about racism it's not conservative republican you know i don't i'm not a conservative republican but it's not them always up on stage being like hey like this is all about race this is all about race it's the left that does that mm. and it's like yeah I, w I would absolutely like to believe that racism's in the past but it, I think I think it was Morgan Freeman that said we need to stop talking about it. <laughs> you know, when my parents grew up, uh, funny story. My dad went to. I don't know if you ever seen the movie. Remember the Titans? It's like a football movie. I know my dad went, it, yeah. Yeah, my dad went to T.C. Williams High School, and man, I think he was in like eighth or ninth grade when. Well, I, I, I'm not sure how knowledgeable you are about uh, America, but uh, during like the 60s and 70s, they had integration. So there used to be white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods, and that was it. Uh, to go to school, you had to walk through the black neighborhood. They had to walk through your neighborhood. It was dangerous. You had to walk in groups. Uh, if you were caught alone, you were going to be in a fight. And when schools got integrated, man, they had actual race riots. I'm sure you can just go Google, you know, race riot, T.C. Williams High School. They had blacks on one side, whites on the other side, and cops in the middle. Now just fast forward one generation. I grew up with Jamaican friends, Chinese friends, Korean friends, Arab friends, Russian friends. In fact, I always mention that most of my friends growing up were, weren't white. They were Arab or you know some some different race like we just never even thought about it just never even thought about huh like why is this Chinese guy here why is this Arab guy here just never thought about it we used to make fun of each other but you know there's a difference between being racist and being funny and yeah. you make fun of each other you know oh my Arab friend's gonna blow this up oh you know my Russian friend's gonna spy and you just we'd make we joke with each other but we never ever thought like oh man I, I look down on you I think I'm better than you just never crossed our mind but that happened in one generation so the idea that it's still as bad as race riots, it's a joke. I, I remember kids of different races you know, making those jibes at each other and it's all taken in good humor. But if, if like a teacher who was social justice warrior heard it, would send them all to oh, counseling. Yeah. And the problem is like, they're telling their side of the story. Who knows what details they throw in there? Like, yeah, he said X, X and Y. It's like, no, I only said Z. Like what's the X and Y? I never said that. And, you know, they'll apply side with the teacher. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, one crazy story. I was in uh, ninth grade. I'll never forget this. I walked by the locker room. It must have been like the end of the school day. I, I forget. I was walking outside. And a teacher had walked in on this couple having sex. And they're, they're in the locking room, the locker room. And I kid you not, the girl stands up. They were having sex. They were a couple. And the girl stands up and said, he raped me. Now I never heard from, I never heard or saw from that guy again, but you can imagine what happened. They were just a couple, and she freaked out like, "Man, I'm I'm gonna get a bad grade now. I'm gonna I'm gonna get in trouble like to throw that guy's life away." Be be careful, man. I don't know if you got a girlfriend or you deal with girls, man. Just just be careful out there, guys. Like uh, you know, people can really fuck you over. But that's the kind of society we live in today. You gotta really watch out for yourself. You know, word gets out that you're a Nazi or this and that. It doesn't have to be true. Enough people just have to think it's think it's true and have your address. Uh, it's the same in Australia with the, the modern feminist movement. We have the, the campus rape crisis, but we have a really good uh, anti-feminist in, in Australia. I shouldn't say a men's rights yeah. activist, Bettina Arndt. She's doing this tour of university campuses debunking 
there was a Human Rights Commission report uh, suggesting that there's this epidemic of sexual assault on university campuses, but right. included things such as a staring or a unwanted comments like asking a woman out on a date. So it was, it, it was right. really absurd. And, and of oh, course, right. we, we also have in Australia the uh, domestic violence uh, epidemic that uh, that it's well it's, it's not just physical violence but telling a, a, a sexist joke for example uh, women produce uh, milk and eggs so they should belong in the kitchen uh, that, that's oh, considered yeah. a gateway to domestic violence you know I don't know if I don't well actually I guess yeah I knew a guy this was probably four or five years ago and this story just blew my mind it was when I first moved to Colorado um, so imagine this guy and his girlfriend they're in their apartment and they have a verbal argument I don't know why, like, I'm sure in hindsight, like, it just looks so stupid, but for whatever reason, they called the cops. I guess the law in Colorado is if the cops are called for a domestic violence, it doesn't have to be violence, just, like, they're calling for a disturbance call, someone has to go to jail. So I'm pretty sure, like, his girlfriend was the one, like, doing, like, most of the yelling and, like, called the cops, and, like, he's just, like, you know, trying to calm it down. Cops show up, take him to jail. He got, like, 18 months probation. And you know how people, like, take, like, drug tests every once in a while with their probation officer? They were having him take this one drug test. I swear to God, he said he couldn't drink a beer. That's like mm. that's how often they test. So I mean, you can imagine that's a big hassle. You're tied to the state for 18 months over oh, fucking what? I'm sure. I'm sure. Like one of the first things they said to the cop is like, "Look, I'm glad you're here, but we're fine. We just had an argument. You know, can we just go to bed? I don't want to go to jail. That's the law. So whether it's a joke or whether it's just uh, they, they think you guys are fighting, it's just totally crazy. I don't understand that law. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. The way it's designed is that uh, the woman, she she won't tell what's really going on because she's battered. And so if she says that uh, it's you know just a minor disturbance, they, yeah. they, they'll they take her as that, oh, she's just trying to keep the peace. And once we go, he'll start beating her again. That's the... Yeah, the it's perception. like all the, all the, all, all the fake scenarios for anything. You know, the Jesse Smollett guy who like faked that attack. I mean, yeah. you know, the, these fake incidents really detract from like the real incidents. There is real rape. There is real racism. It's usually not where the left is pointing. Now, we'll go back to uh, the Trump phenomena. You're, you're good at going off on, on tangent, which is fun. because Can you saying? tell? Yeah. <laughs> Libertarians were divided on, on Trump. There were those who believed he was the embodiment of modern fascism. Most prominent of that was, was Jeffrey Tucker, which it was amazing transformation because he used to work at the, the Mises Institute, and now he's the chief propagator of the the Trump as a fascist theory and of course libertarians yeah. are divided on immigration and so the the wall was controversial because mm. libertarians uh, probably the the main thing they argue is on on borders and you know under what conditions should we have open immigration and, and, the, so, and the whole immigration debate is just a big straw man from both sides attention turned to the the libertarian party primaries and there was gary johnson uh, john mcafee mm -hmm. and austin peterson and Sossel hosted the libertarian presidential debate and gary johnson was the most mediocre of them all there was the famous one where the the jewish bakery should be forced to bake the the nazi cake you know, that one is pretty damn bad, obviously, but honestly, I think the worst one, he was asked, he was, he was doing like a, not a speech, but like, you know, they had like, like, like a panel and they'd ask questions to everybody. And Gary was asked, like, what do you think about the non-aggression principle? And he just, gave them, he just gave the weirdest answer ever. His answer was pretty much, well, you know, I, I believe in the non-aggression principle, but I mean, at the end of the day, that kind of stuff just kind of goes over my head. <laughs> the, the, the NAP goes over your head? Like... What is Aleppo? Okay, I, honestly, most people didn't know where Aleppo was. That's just the truth. But to, to say you believe in the non-aggression principle and that it goes over your head? I mean, people, if you don't believe me, just, just go YouTube that right now. I'm not kidding. It's, it's totally crazy. It's like how... I like Gary Johnson as a guy. He's probably fun to smoke a joint with. But man, he should have put the joint down for the campaign, man. He should have really, really tried to educate himself. His whole reason for saying that he had the Aleppo gaff, this is his reason. He said, well... If you can't find the country on the map, you can't blow them up. <laughs> I, I, I guess he's got a point, but I don't know. I, I don't think people are going to vote for stupid just because, oh, he's so, he's so stupid, he won't get anything done. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I remember the Newsacre's reaction to Johnson saying, what's the left And he's like, you're kidding, aren't you? And so yeah. it's basically like, how can, you, how can you not know? But even though he was the, the most mediocre candidate, he still got the nomination and he picked 
uh, former Republican Governor Bill World as his running mate. And Bill World, in the end, went rogue and urged people to vote for, for Hillary Clinton. He didn't understand just how much libertarians despise the political establishment. And so even, even though Trump and Clinton were quite unpopular with the a lot of voters, uh, Gary Johnson only managed to get 3% of the vote. And there was a lot of debate That's about the whole whether, joke. Yeah, whether that was a success or not, because I remember Reason were writing at the time, hey, we can get 15%, we can uh, get in the, 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 the presidential debates. There was, I noticed afterwards that those who believed that Gary Johnson was the pure libertarian option was saying, yeah, 3%, that's our, that's our best ever. But it was significantly, it was revising expectations. That's funny. That was actually a turning point in my development of my, my views because I, how many years ago was this? I was actually going to vote for Gary Johnson the last election. Um, I think within the last like two months before the election, I read Economics in One Lesson. Uh, I mean, for anyone who, who doesn't know, Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. It's not only one of the most beautifully written, um, complete books ever. Just read the first two chapters. It'll take you 10 minutes. You'll never look at the world the same way again. Because yeah, he, asks, he, he asks you things like, huh, if I break a window, that means that a window glazer has to come along and fix the window. But all that really means is that that $100 that was going to be saved, you know, maybe you're going to hire another employee. Maybe you're going to... Uh, buy something else, invest in the economy. Now you have to spend that on broken glass. And he, it, but, um, he just makes you think like, huh, there are scenes and unseens in economics and politicians only look at the scene. So for example, I think in Denmark right now, their tax rates are insane. And a lot of the tax rates are actually hidden in, in uh, the Nordic countries. That's why uh, if you ask people in Nordic, Nordic countries, like how much taxes do you pay? They actually pay about twice as much. They just think they pay that much. It's weird. I can name a few books on that. Um, but yeah, Denmark, for example, I think upwards of like 60% of your income gets taxed. Now, imagine 60% of your income gets taxed. And then you're so surprised. Oh, my God, they, they built a road for me. They, they did this. They did that. I have access to that. It's like, no kidding. What, what, if you, they took 60% of your income, wouldn't you expect something? Wouldn't you expect something? But they think about that all completely backwards. Like, oh, I mean... <laughs> Here's a, here's a crazy uh, fact. When we were about to start the Revolutionary War, we did it because we didn't want to pay two weeks worth of wages to King George. Two weeks. If you pay 30% of your income in taxes today, you're working for the government from January to mid-April. But just imagine how little we went. We had a revolution over like 2-3% taxes. Today, it's just like people want like 90% marginal tax rates because they think they're smart. They don't even know what a marginal tax rate is, but they know it's like a high number and it's going to tax the rich and they're going to be fine. It's not going to harm them. This Hell is yeah. the world we live in. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sad. I mean, I, I try to get people to think about things just a different way for the first time ever, even if they don't agree with me. Because, man, otherwise, we're fucking doomed, man. Thankfully in Australia, the conversation lately in both parties has been we need to get taxes lower there's just disagreement about the strategy to do it and who will will get it so well i'm curious what australia is like by the way i mean i don't mean to take over your show and be the host but i am curious like in australia what are taxes like what is what is daily life like do you feel like the government's always up in your shit like that kind of thing a government is more present in your life than i'd say in the in the united states i mean uh, for for all the that people hated George W. Bush, Obama, and Trump, they didn't impact your your daily life. Well, the the federal government they're involved in in so much in terms of welfare and services. You definitely like feel the the arm of of government, and there is mm -hmm. a lot of even though we don't like to be taxed in Australia, we still expect a lot from government. That becomes a generational thing. Like my dad had it, my grandpa had it. I should be able to have it. Australians, they, I, w I wouldn't say that they believe in government, but they've accepted government and have an expectation about how a government will should uh, behave. Yeah, and of course, everybody has their own idea about what government is. I mean, they see the government as these people helping you out. You know, they're just making sure, look, looking out for the best for you. And from our point of view, it's like these murdering, sick evil megalomaniacs i mean these are the sickest people you can imagine trying to rule our lives um i think even back when we had the 13 colonies 
the, the representation wasn't great, but I think today it's like one congressperson or whatever represents like 500,000 people or something like that. It's like insane. I, I ran the numbers the other day. It's insane. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, that's why no, that, that's why California wants to break up. I don't know if people understand this. Yeah, yeah, uh, I've, I've heard yeah. all about that because it's, it's yeah. such a large state and yet what is it, it has about 100 people in the state legislature. South California controls the whole state's politics. And people in North, uh, North California, you know, a lot of people in North California live in the woods. They live in the Emerald Triangle and they grow a bunch of weed. They just want to be left alone. But, again, uh, would you want Los Angeles controlling the Emerald Triangle? I wouldn't. These fuckers just want taxes. They just want money. They want money or your property. I mean, if there isn't something there to take, they, they don't care. Yeah, definitely the devolution of, of government is definitely something that can counter a lot of uh, what you just described. I mean, one of our, our most diverse states is, is Queensland, which is up in the north. The, the southeast is where most people live. That is becoming very urbanized and middle class and so their demands are a lot different than the people who live in central north queensland which is a largely rural agricultural mining area and isn't australia like most of the population centered in like well, it's like the right side in the south you know it's it's actually centered like it's not like the whole uh country on, of australia on, on the east coast that's where right right and exactly. at 80 percent of australians live in cities so so queensland because it's the there is such a division between the north and the south there's been a push to create a separate north queensland state so so they can look after their own interests and not have policy dictated to by the the people that live in the urban areas in the in the southeast so it's 2019 now it's been two and a half years of president trump and contrary to uh, what people were alarming us about or, or fearing it's not a, a fascist police state the, the economy has has not collapsed in my opinion things in terms of the state of liberty in 2019 it's pretty much the same i mean there's there's been some improvements but there's also a lot of areas that still need addressing and we knew that trump wasn't very libertarian but he's just the president and i spoke about this before the the republican party what they, like they're telling us for for six years that they were going to repeal obamacare you know they right. they had the house and the senate that's not gonna happen they didn't they didn't it's ruined too many people's lives i mean where do you go from rock bottom <laughs> uh, it's crazy it's crazy what's your rational analysis of united states 2019 well, it's, it's very polarized and discombobulated right now in the U.S. Um, now, obviously, the media hypes everything up. The media, you know, the media operates by making you think the world's about to blow up tomorrow. I mean, that's, see, like, one, the whole thing with, like, immigration, you, you really think they're going to report on the 6 o'clock news about a family, whether they migrated legally or illegally, that's irrelevant. Just whether they migrated peacefully and they're working here and they're living here and they're having a good life. You think that's good 6 o'clock news footage? No. What's good six o'clock news footage is a drug cartel member that kills somebody. Like, go go figure. You have a drug war. By the way, the drug war, I think, since the 1970s cost like a trillion dollars. Uh, pretty penny. Um, but what was the result? Well, the result is that you get artificially high drug prices. And it's one of those things where, like, it doesn't matter if you're in Palestine or Mexico or wherever you are around the world. If you're born with a gun put in your hand and you're told to kill people, you become numb to it at a very young age. So on the one hand, you have... 99 plus percent of Mexicans are some of the nicest people you ever meet. They're family oriented. They have pride. You know, there's very much a mentality of, you know, you want to eat, you're going to work. You can just tell that they have that attitude. In America, you know, just yesterday I was at the dollar store and this woman just, she was like, hey, can you bring my cart over to me? And it was just totally random. I think she was drunk or something. And I was just talking to the cashier like, we're just joking like Americans, man. Like they just, they ask for something and they just expect to get it. Imagine how that applies to politics. Iran, you better do what we want to do or you're going to get it. North Korea, you better do what we want you to do or you're going to get it. That's how we get shit done in America. Uh, you mentioned immigration of Mexicans there. The, the wall and just the, the southern border, well, that is still the, the central issue with the ICE detention facilities on the southern border about the conditions there. That's been a point of contention. The, the ICE raids 
in various US cities. And we saw the Supreme Court decision where it was quite interesting. I couldn't believe Nancy Pelosi's uh, tweet that uh, Trump stole from the military to fund the border wall. I mean, right. <laughs> stealing from the military. I'm OK with that. Yeah. Look, immigration is one area where I know for a fact I'm pretty nuanced here. I know for a fact some of your, some of your viewers and maybe even you are going to hear some of the stuff for the first time. And it's like, oh, OK, I don't know where I don't know what to do with this information, but that puts it into perspective. So the southern border wall, the line, whatever you want to call it, it's about like it's about like 2,000 miles, say 2,000 miles. Well, I think the average person envisions that you have 2,000 miles. It's already owned by the federal government. All they got to do is slap up a wall. Not the case. Not even close to the case. Uh, when you actually do some research, a lot of that 2,000 miles, private property owners own houses and big plots of land, stuff like that. And not even that. A lot of them are, so this comes down to eminent domain, right? It's obviously where this is going. If they want to build the wall, they're going to have to use eminent domain. Uh, they're going to have to kill people, Tim, because think about it. Some of these farmers, they've had that land for probably generations. And he, there's some people on record saying, I will not give up my land for a trillion dollars. It's the principle of the thing. And damn right, I wouldn't give up my land too. I would die for it. People are going to start dying if they, if they actually are serious about building the wall. That's what it's going to take. Another thing that another thing that they'll talk about. So you'll hear things about like seven billion dollars for the border wall. That's like that that funds like a few miles of the wall. I hope you guys understand. Like the actual cost of the wall, who knows? It, it might be tens of billions, hundreds of uh, hundreds of billions. People think it's me like seven billion or something. Like yeah, just borrow from the the welfare fund of the food. I mean, people have no idea what they're talking about. People have a, people have an idea that I'm either for or against immigration, and. In their minds, they don't like to admit that, you know, they're really only talking about the southern border. You, th you think you think uh, neoconservatives worry about ca uh, Canadians coming over the north? Oh, it wow. happens, but they don't, they don't worry about it. They don't, they don't talk. And, and for the most part, they don't talk about it. Some do, but for the most part, it's all, all Mexico. Um, I could just throw out so many facts here, Tim. How about this? Uh, Trump will go on about how you have MS-13 members coming over. Okay, that's true. Where, where are MS-13 members from? El Salvador. Now, I'm not saying they don't recruit Mexicans and all everyone in uh, Central America, but people who watch the news, they don't know that. Well, they, hear, they, hear, they, hear Trump, they hear Trump saying MS-13 members are coming over. They're raping your kids. They're uh, selling your kids drugs. They're killing you. And that's like the epitome of what a Mexican is. It, it, my girlfriend's Mexican, by the way. She lives in Mexico. It's just, ah, uh, it's totally insane because it's all funded by the drug war. And I, at the same time, like Trump doesn't admit that. He says, oh, they're bringing drugs in here. Well, I think, I think that a lot of Americans are becoming aware that the people coming from Mexico through the southern border are not Mexican. I mean, the migrant caravan, for well, example, Mar they're, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're from Central America. And Columbia, Peru, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mexico yeah. itself is not happy about all these Central Americans coming to uh, their country. I mean, the, the migrant caravan has been quite disruptive to a lot of Mexican towns and cities. So, Oh, yeah. I had a friend living in Mexico City, and they said, you know, as they passed through, it was uh, it was scary because you have a lot, of, a lot of the media perpetuating a lot of the inner tension there. You know, they'll they'll pull up with their cameras, and they get all these shots of people starving, walking with their two-year-old kids. And you, know, you look at the big picture; it's like it's a little bit different than that. But usually, there's some bits of truth on both sides, and that's like the big issue. So yes, it is true that Mexico is a very, very dangerous country. I'm not kidding you. If you go there, first of all, you got to know Spanish. If you don't know Spanish, you're, I won't say, I'm not going to say you're going to get robbed, but they're just going to take advantage of you in every step. Like you're going to, you're going to pay like a thousand pesos for a taxi to go a mile. <laughs> Whereas if you just knew a little bit of Spanish, you can get around. But Mexico is very dangerous because of the drug cartels. It, you don't need that big of a, you don't need to own that big of a territory to really, really terrorize everybody. Uh, for example, my girlfriend got a call from her friend the other day, it was a few weeks ago. And you know, what's really common in Mexico, because again, Mexico is very family oriented. So imagine you and your girlfriend get kidnapped and you're held for ransom and they call your parents and be like, hey, we got your, got your kid. Um, you, know, you know what to do. Like, you know, they will kill it. They will kill them, by the way. That's the crazy part. Like if you're held for ransom, they don't pay. They will kill you. They don't care. These are killers. They'd rather have the money because they want to do it again. And another crazy thing, it's like when you're robbing people in Mexico, these people are so poor. Imagine robbing somebody and like, what do you get, like 500 pesos? Like two meals? It's yeah. relatively, relatively nothing. Like if you rob people in the US, you can probably, 
you know, you might you might strike gold, but in Mexico, I just I can't imagine it. I can't imagine it, and it's uh, uh, I could I could bring up so many points, but yeah, people need uh, to, people need to understand that if you if you've never left the country, you have no idea what it's like because you've never been. It's a real culture shock, but you know it's really good for people to step outside of their bubble and try to understand. You know, you go to Mexico and like the last thing you think leaving Mexico is like, man, these people are dangerous. No, it's the drug cartels that are dangerous. You don't think we have cartel type people in the U.S.? We sure do. All over Chicago, Detroit, New York City, Miami, all over. We've, we've had the stories of the the violence of the Mexican drug cartels filter to, to Australia because, well, people are attracted to that like gang gang violence. They even though they don't like it, it's they're they're fascinated by it. I mean, they're fascinated by Australia's organized crime. It's just a fascination that that people have. Now, I want to talk about uh, foreign policy under Trump, or as we call it, the U.S. Empire, because. Right. Well, Trump, he's maintained the existing alliances that the U.S. has with Israel and, and Saudi Arabia, which are, are problematic. But it yeah. seems to, to me that with foreign wars, he's done enough to placate the, the neoconservatives, but then he's, he's pulled out before like, shit's gotten really bad. Like the Syria strikes, it's sort of, oh, look, I'm doing something, but I'm not really going to do something. And and the same with Iran, like he pulled off, he pulled out of the attack at the, the last minute. He ends up doing the the right thing, before yeah. we're at the brink. You know, it's one of those things where like I'm pretty sure whether you're pro Trump, anti Trump, in the middle, day to day you have no idea what he thinks. Mm. You have a, a sense, you can see what he does day to day, but you don't know what he's going to do tomorrow and the next day. Um, I don't know we can talk about Syria. I mean, uh, so for people who don't don't know. Um, over the past few years, there's been information released that uh, Assad's gassing his people, which if you just look at the evidence, it doesn't make sense that he would do yeah. that. This, 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 this has happened over and over and over again. And every time we, we're about to pull out of Syria, oh man, they just gassed our people. <laughs> and, and this gas is like, I think one of the gases is like chlorine gas. And if I remember correctly, um, it's odorless and, and you can't smell it. It's just all of a sudden you're just sitting here like you are now and you start suffocating. So it must be a very, very scary way to die just... You know, what the hell is happening to me? If you get shot, like, yeah, I'm going to die. But just all of a sudden you start suffocating. So that is serious if that happened, but there's no reason to believe that that actually happened. It was just uh, it was just all a lie. Like, all, like the Iraq wars are a lie. The Afghanistan wars are a lie. It's just all a lie. People have no idea why we're there. Um, people couldn't point to these countries on a map. They couldn't tell you the dates. All they know is that there's an enemy over there. And, man, if we, if we, if we don't stay over there, they're going to come over here. Yeah, they're, they're going to come over here. I mean, people live in their own world, I'm telling you. They just, I, I remember seeing this crazy video many, many years ago, and essentially just soldiers talking to like random Muslim people in countries, and they're showing them like a picture of 9 11, and they had no idea what it was. So just imagine we're so tapped into our electronics, like we get instant access to information. If President Trump gets shot right now, we're going to hear about it in five minutes, whereas if you didn't have that, if you live in kind of a third world country, information takes a little, long, uh, a little longer to pass through. So you have all these factors and Europe really puts things in perspective. Well, a lot of the people are displaced in, in the Middle East. They've been going to, to Europe, so they yeah. can't get to America. Yeah. But in Europe, they've had the, the migrant crisis, which is well, there's also pull factors as well. So it's a, it's a complicated uh, thing. Yeah. But everyone believes that Iraq, the invasion of Iraq by George W. Bush, that was or the only sort yeah. of mass foreign intervention, but there was yeah. Libya under under Obama, and well, Syria was started also under Obama as well. And then we got Yemen, we got Somalia. Yeah. Um, every, I, honestly, if you really want to go way back in history, I mean, this ultimately has to do with Israel and Saudi Arabia and Palestine. Um, it's a big long story. It would just take me too long to get into yeah, it. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, I could recommend a few books on it. One book I'd recommend is by Ilan Papi. Pape, I think it's pronounced. It's um, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Now, let me just briefly mention that when I picked up that book, you know, I grew up in a neoconservative family, and not, the mentality is it's really odd. You know, we grew up in a Christian family, but our perception of Jews were, you know, Jews are God's chosen people. Uh, he 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 um, chose Israel for the Jews, and that's where they're going to live, and that's their land, uh, dating back thousands of years. So that's the argument. But then you just look at the history. Now. When I talk to people like Walter Block, I talk to him about this, and he doesn't believe in the statute of limitations. It basically says, like, imagine your grandfather's shirt got stolen 100 years ago. 
So 100 years, it doesn't matter how much time's passed, you can go reclaim what's yours. So in the case of the Jews, well, 2,000, 3,000 years, whenever they settled there, it doesn't matter. So that was their land they were able to go back and take it. Now, I have a few problems with that argument. Well, I, I, I should have asked Walter Block, like, well, hold on. So you live in a house right now. Imagine people came along to your door and just like, hey, I'm really sorry to do this to you, but this is my house and reclaiming it. Like, I heard you don't believe in the statute of limitations. Like, he wouldn't buy that for a second. Um, you know, but what did happen with the Palestinians uh, in the 1940s, it was horrendous. Imagine you have 700,000 people marched away from their homes, you know, basically directed, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard of Gaza and the West Bank. Gaza's a nightmare, man. Because Israel controls everything in Gaza. They control how much power runs a day. They control yeah. food, food access because if you look at Gaza on a map, it's closed in. They have nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's really insane. It's like second or third most densely populated. I don't know if you call it like a state or country, whatever you want to call it, like a little area there. It's very, very dense. I think the median age there is like 14, 15, 16. Wow. Think about that. Yeah. Now, going back to domestic uh, U.S. policies, so Trump has he's cut regulation, which is pretty easy to do at an executive level. He's cut here, he's added here. I mean, it's whatever you want to focus on. It's, uh, he's done both, yeah. There, of course, have been further tax cuts, which has helped stimulate the, the U.S. economy. We could get into a whole other debate about whether that is real economic growth, but I don't think... Yeah, I'll that now. No, it's, it's not real. And I'm with Peter Schiff. I, I don't think there's any reason to believe that like we can predict when that's going to happen and i think people straw man peter schiff for that like peter schiff's just saying like when the, when the next recession happens it's gonna be worse than 2008 and they might they might not be able to save it because obviously in 2008 they bailed out the banks and they just barely made it by it's kind of like if you run out of alcohol and you're like damn the liquor store is closed i'm, I'm dead but you, know, you check under the cabinets like oh i still got a few few shots left that's basically what happened so we're running out of alcohol again and there might not be any more under the cabinet again because, you know, we, we saw housing collapse last time, you know, imagine like a bunch of sectors just collapse at once. Well, well the, the debt has been completely forgotten. That's one of the things that the, the yeah. Tea Party was at the, at the time uh, fo focusing on, that America's going to go broke soon, but Republicans just voted to, to raise the, the debt ceiling yeah. again. So it's, it's not talked about at all. And then, of course, uh, Trump is using tariffs strategically as 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 a form of uh foreign policy pawn playing which is can be quite disruptive to to economic activity even though like he, he, they're, they're not going to stick i mean it's like damn it trump like i hate what you're doing with you know tariffs for taxation and taxation is theft but his plan kind of works i mean he, he he threatened he threatened mexico and what do you know someone who has a gun pointed at their head back down what do you know that's essentially what happened. I mean, those tariffs are really hurt. Again, Mexicans are, on average, very, very poor down there. And I'm, if, you ever, if you ever get a chance to go, man, you're going to have a blast, and you won't believe how cheap it is down there. I mean, like, a, like 200 pesos, which is like 10 bucks. I mean, like breakfast and dinner for two people. <laughs> it's, insa it's, it's insane. And just coming back to America, everything is so expensive relatively. These are poor people, man. What are they going to do in a situation like that? Nothing. You can't do anything. Now, the Libertarians in Congress have reacted differently to Trump's presidency. Justin Amash, he's quit the Republican Party. He's disgusted at Trump's presidency and the, and the party for basically, they've all fallen into line behind Trump. All the, all the never Trumpers, Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham, they, they all do Trump's bidding now. He tweeted out something, uh, you know, making fun of him. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> uh, but Thomas Massey and, and Rand Paul, they've, They've, they've stayed and, well, even though they don't agree with Trump on a lot of things, they, they still believe that they can do good work. And, well, Rand Paul, he's got chosen to be Trump's envoy to Iran, which I'm really excited about. And I saw Mark Levin was really triggered by that. And I'm like, that's great. That's... Oh, yeah. Mark Levin's trigger. That's, that's awesome. Mm. You know, As... Mark Levin's one of these neo neocon guys who I've heard Mark Levin say, like, word for word, uh, there will be peace when all the Palestinians are dead. Mm. And I kept rewinding that, like, did he really just say that? Did he really just say that? And it's like, you know, because they ultimately think that people in the Middle East, Arabs, they're just going to attack us till they die. So the only way to have peace is to kill them first. It's, it's insane. It's evil. And that's the first step to becoming a libertarian is just taking a step back. Like, do I really believe this? Do I really believe in the slaughtering of innocent children? And it, it, it goes way beyond that. So 
I, I just got to recommend the podcast real quick, uh, Foreign Policy Focus. My friend Kyle Anzalon hosts that. Very, very good show. I mean, this guy knows his stuff. He works with Scott Horton. Well, Ryan Pauly also chose to to jump on recently on the on the squad that Trump's been attacking, telling them to to leave America. He suggested that Ilhan Omar go back to Somalia to to appreciate how good America is. Which well, that, well, that's divided libertarians who there was and the the Libertarian Party put out a a tweet that said we condemn bigotry and racism of all forms and which was right. seen as so uh, brave. Quite, and that's the the other thing that's resulted from trump the libertarian party itself has become very embracing social justice and very critical of of trump believing he's increased the size of the state so the cato institute and reason or the head of the yeah. the, the libertarian party nicholas Stolwell, and who do you and who do you think of when you think of the Libertarian Party? You think of Nick Sarwick? Yes, uh, yes, him. Most people probably think of Bill Weld. I mean, people just, this is their first image of the Libertarian Party, whereas uh, if we just get someone else in there, hmm. maybe someone from the Mises Caucus, I'm not saying we're going to fix the world, but man, if we just have, you know, no, no one in their right mind is going to say, man, my life was just in shambles, like, you know, everything was just falling apart. And then I ran across a Nick Sarwick article. Hmm. Man, my, my, my worldview was just flipped upside down. Like, uh, no one ever uh, says that. Or you read no a ever. Cato Institute policy paper. <sighs> Talk about Cato forever, man. You know Murray Rothbard founded the name for the Cato Institute. Because, yeah, yeah, I know all, uh, I know my libertarian history. I know oh, the, there you go. the split uh, between what was Rothbard and the Koch brothers in the Cato Institute, and he founded the, yeah. the Mises Institute, and it's been an, an ongoing feud. And... Well, the Cato Institute, they basically view the Mises Institute as a secret enabler of white supremacy in right. America. And it's not, it's, God, I, when I was at the Mises University, I'm pretty sure I met someone from every race there. Mm. The whole race, there are some people who actually say, yeah, all they do at the Mises Institute, they sit around and talk trash about Israel. And I could talk trash about Israel, but I'm not saying, I'm not talking trash about Jews. In their mind, yeah. if talk well, trash about Israel. Was Dave Smith there? Right, yeah, I, duh. Uh, I don't know how they how they keep this lie going because the Mises Institute was set up to commemorate a Jew. Uh, Burton Bloomer, David Gore, and Walter Block. Um, pretty much everyone that founded the institute was Jewish. It's like, how, how do you... I, I love it. I love how the Southern Poverty Law Center considers it a separatist group. Uh, De Lorenzo calls it the Soviet Poverty Lie Center. That's mm. a better name for them. You know, the whole problem with talking about Israel is when I talk about Israel, I'm talking about the state of Israel... The government there i'm not talking about jews that's relevant but some people when they talk about israel they are talking about jews now Il ilhan omar it's sad to say it she definitely leans more toward that anti-semitic side whereas a lot of people like norman finkelstein and noam chomsky they're very good on israel they're not talking about jews they're both jewish they're just talking about like huh my my uh, this is what norman finkelstein argues that you know my my mom and dad were in the concentration camps under nazi germany and, you know, all he's saying is that the tactics that Israel uses, they're kind of similar to what the Nazis use. Call it what you want. You know, we have this stuff happens every single day where essentially, you know, everyone in Gaza, they don't have anything. They're very, very poor in Gaza. And Israel's very rich. Israel has all the they get billions of dollars in aid. They have all the advanced weaponry. Um, so when you hear about like Pal Palestinians launching rockets over to Israel, what they're actually talking about is like, more or less low-grade fireworks. Sometimes I'll light a tire on fire. Sometimes like a one Molotov cocktail. What is that going to do against machine guns and 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 uh, you know rockets? And what it, it is? It's no match. It's no, I, I can't even explain it any better than that. It's it's no match. But the way the media um, describes it, well, it's it's either way. It's either Israel's um, should take all the blame or Palestine should take all the blame. That's just one or the other. But in reality, it's just these are human beings, and there's a big wall separating them. And the people in Gaza, I just go do 10 minutes of research and tell me if you at least want to think about it a little more because people just they have these conceptions of things in their head, whatever well, it is. Let's focus on the, the other high profile member of the squad, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Who now, it's lovely. Yeah, she's the, the darling of the, the modern progressive movement, even though she, well, she says so many stupid things. The, uh, the most famous one is that. Uh, people are focused on being uh, pedantically, factually correct rather than being morally right. And she's neither, right? Mm -hmm. No, can I just tell you a few more? Uh, I at least have two here that are just absolutely hilarious. Yep, go for it. 
There was one time where she said, I kid you not. I'll, I'll run the math for you then if you didn't catch it. She said, there are 200 million Americans in the U.S. that make less than $20,000 a year. What she said amounts to 40% of the population. Just do that math again. 200,000 <laughs> people uh, make less than $20,000, and that's 40% of the population. So what she's essentially saying is that there's 500 million people in the U.S. <laughs> I mean, she, she was an economics major, supposedly. That was what she got her bachelor's in, was, was economics. And she doesn't know anything. I'm telling you, she doesn't know anything. This one's my favorite. Can't make this stuff up. So imagine it's like a January or a February, February in a year, and you tweet out, rideshare services like Uber and Lyft are causing taxi drivers to commit suicide. I actually don't doubt it because in New York City, I know that taxi medallions per taxi was like a million dollars a medallion, something like that. It's like $200,000 now. It's nothing. Um, but she said that. Fast forward a few months later, I kid you not, Tim. Her campaign spent like $5,000 on Uber and like 2500 <laughs> on Juno, and it amounts to like hundreds of, hundreds of rideshare rides. And again, later, a few months down the line, she's saying this thing again, like this is causing taxi drivers to commit suicide. It's like, you know, it's so funny because these are open campaign records. I can just link you to it for your, for your audience. It's all out in the open, like Uber, 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 like 196 rides or something like that, five grand. How do you, how do you fathom that? Yeah. The, yeah. the the same people that love her are the same people who said that Sarah Palin was was stupid. I mean, she right. is yeah. your Sarah Palin. Like, why can't you recognize that? And then there are some conservatives or libertarians, as I call them, who say, "Oh, you shouldn't criticize AOC, otherwise you'll you'll make her president." Because apparently that's what happened with Trump. But going back to the Palin one, like she was so heavily criticized that she didn't become vice president. She never ran for for office again. Yeah. The reason why Trump won, despite being attacked, is because a lot of the attacks on him were irrational. But you just pointed out there the attacks on AOC are, you know, well founded, and just pointing out how flawed her her arguments and her policies. You don't have to and... spin it at all. She just literally says these things word for word. It's like, oh my god, mm. that's hilarious. That's totally a meme right there. Mm. I saw this one funny meme. I saw this one funny meme for AOC. It's like, yay, my IQ test came back ne negative. Yeah. <laughs> So apparently we're not allowed to criticize AOC, otherwise we'll somehow make her president. So we're just supposed to let her get away with all of these statements. I don't know. Did you watch the Democratic debate? I, I watched like 10 minutes of it. I just couldn't do it. But basically for my 10 minutes of the debate, what I got out of it is they're going to ensure Trump gets elected. Well, that's why Trump went after the squad. He's going to crush them in the debates. Like Trump is, what are you going to call it, tenure now? Like he knows what he's doing. He, he, he crushed Hillary like... Hillary's, Hillary's like asking him one question. And he's just like, your your husband's a pedophile and a uh, rapist, and <laughs> you know, he he just he's you can't predict what he's gonna do. And Trump, you know, say what you want about the guy, that guy gets up there and wings it every single day. You think you're gonna you think you're gonna write a script for Trump, maybe for the State of the Union, but in general, like you could tell he's wing, you can just tell he's winging it. <laughs> you know, what, what other president does this? Another thing that was kind of historic that Michael Malice pointed out is. When was the last sitting president that ever, you know, as the Democratic debates are going, just like getting involved in a debate and like chastising him and being you know, like, how oh, you're so dumb, blah, blah, blah. I don't think yeah. any sitting president's done that before. So he's setting all these weird precedents. He's just super troll. Um, depending on my mood, he's pissing off all the people I hate. Depending on my mood the other day, it's like, man, like I want to go towards the direction of less government, not more. And that he's, you know, he's funny, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's uh, our rights aren't a joke. Our rights yeah. predate governments. I think we're both anarchists, right? I, I wouldn't call myself an anarchist, but I want to reduce oh. government as as much as possible. I, we'll, we'll see how much we can reduce, and well, yeah. then we can talk about anarchy. My concession there is, I'll, I'll meet you halfway. When we get down to three, we, three functions of government, we can argue, do we need less than this? Mm. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Maybe, maybe government will be so small that it's irrelevant in our lives. And ultimately, what else can you ask for? I mean, there's always going to be evil people that try to rise up and group together and steal from people and torture them and kill them. And it, that's, that's human nature. That's never going to change. So that's always going to happen. And I think going back to when you're describing Trump, I mean, going back to he's been a disruptor. I mean, things have been mm -hmm. the same forever in the United States. I mean, right. a small right. government has been promised. We've been lied to, like, when the Republic, Republican Revolution happened in 1994, uh, they promised smaller government it, it didn't happen so why not yeah. just have somebody who's just going to disrupt things and just make yeah. politics entertaining i mean if politicians are gonna suck 
you 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 may as well you know? like have a commander in chief who's he's just going to roll things up and and just send the you know stuffy people into a frenzy. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where I'm not sure who I honestly hate worse because you have the Republicans who say they want limited government and go for big government. You have the leftists who say they want big government and they go for big government. So they're actually telling the truth. It's like which is worse? I don't know. Um, at the end of the day, I. I I assume that the left is too stupid to actually do what they want to do. Just when it comes down to it, they're too dumb to do it. Mm. I'm not saying Stalin didn't do it. I'm not saying other dictators didn't do it. But they're going to try and fail. There's, I mean, we're talking about AOC's bad math. I mean, she does that all the time. She does it all the time. And, you know, whenever somebody questions it, it's just like, oh, well, you know, how am I supposed to be perfect? You're an economics, you're an economics major. Uh, don't you know some basic math? There was one time where she said, like, um, you know, the reason unemployment is so low is because people are working multiple jobs. She doesn't even know the unemployment rate formula. Wow. Let's talk Go about ahead. your uh, podcast, uh, Peace and Liberty. Now, nearly every libertarian in the United States has got a, a podcast, uh, it seems. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the most uh, popular one is uh, people like uh, Tom Woods. I, I listen to that when I can, even though in Australia, the, the libertarian movement has become quite fractured and divided, not just over Trump, but a whole bunch of issues and how to react to the major political parties. People's lives are on average so mundane, they just want to be involved in something, they want to feel like they're doing something for the world. I've still never disagreed with, with Tom Woods, I can just flip on a Tom Woods show and yeah. I'll agree with it. I mean, the worst it'll be, it'll be quite dry when he's reading out sort of an old essay. Yeah, and yeah Tom, Woods is, Tom Woods is a good friend of mine, I've known him for a few years now. Went to his thousandth episode event, um, I saw him last year at Mises U. So we're, I would say we're good friends, uh, we talk a lot. Um, I always joke that Tom Woods is kind of responsible for the oversupply of podcasts. Because honestly, I mean, when I started my podcast, I went out of my way to make sure that I don't uh, gain following too fast. Because when I first started my podcast, I was getting like 10, 15, 20 random messages. I can keep up with 10 or 20, but when it's, once it gets to 100, I can't, I can't keep up with yeah. that. So I'm in school right now. Like I'm trying to like graduate, hopefully in December or May. And once I do that, I can podcast five days a week. So it's just takes a lot. Of, honestly, I don't know if this is the same way for you. Probably takes me an hour, two hours, sometimes half an hour to record the episode. This one's like two, three hours to just like edit and export the file. Just yeah, like yeah. exporting the file takes like forever. That takes way longer than the podcast. Yeah. So it's a lot of time. I started my podcast. It, it was really just, I started writing. Um, I, I never ever thought I'd ever be a writer. I just remember one day I was just like, I thought of like a really, really stupid idea for a book and I actually started writing it. So the idea was the, the title is going to be my government and just each chapter is going to be you know how they say like my roads oh mm. we're gonna, they're going to take away my roads if we don't have government well it's kind of like making fun of that like my government my national parks my police my firefighters just you know completely crushing all that so point being i, I started writing and the, the first few years are rough because i look back at my old writing it's like man grammar is incorrect uh one of the ways you start getting good at writing is not just writing but reading a lot i read a lot of really good writers and you start to understand the structure and you know where little things are and you start to stop making less mistakes but i started writing and i just kind of figured this would be if other people don't get anything out of it i get something out of it because a lot of this stuff's just muscle memory i know all these facts because i say it over and over and over again so my podcast if nobody listens it's just like well i got up there for 30 minutes and i repeated stuff to myself that i need to know and that everybody should know um i never planned to be like a millionaire or billionaire but uh yeah, Tom Woods, man. There's so many, so many podcasts out there, and I feel bad because, you know, some of them are really good people. They have no marketing skills. Like I, I've had a few friends, like they did like three episodes, and were just like, I can't do this. I'm not getting any downloads. It's not doing. It. So I, I was never in it for the downloads. I don't know about you. I never ever thought about downloads. I just want to talk to people. Uh, for me, it was a very slow process to gain traction. It was just persistence. There's, there's so many podcasts that have started in Australia, I've done about six episodes and then, then fallen away. So there's a, there's a lot right. that, that fail. And in the United States, it's not just what, the, the libertarian podcast that's over-serviced. The alternative media community is already massive in the United States. I mean, yeah. there, there's Breitbart, Town Hall, Infowars, I'm not sure what your view is. You listen to Tom Woods, you get all your information. You can listen to your friends to be polite. But unless they're really dishing out some like relevant, new, different information, it's just hard to hard to uh, catch people's attention. So that's what I try to do. You know, I've spent a lot of my podcast episodes just reviewing books. Um, I've done Anatomy of the State, chapter by chapter. 
uh, Thomas Sowell's book, Discrimination and Disparities, amazing book. I just covered it chapter by chapter because it's just full of facts. You know, I, I want to get back to more like interviews and stuff like that, but I don't know if you're in college, man. College, it's like a black hole. Time, money, and they yeah, kind of they, they want you to fail so you can just like pay for more classes. Yeah, like, that's really I, don't, how it I don't miss that. Uh, oh, almost, I'm almost done. I see light at the end of the tunnel and then I can... Then I can go be my true anarchist self and write and write because what I want to do is write books and teach. It's weird. I'm a, I'm an economics major, but the last thing I want to do is work for the Federal Reserve or work for a bank. And you know, most of the people I'm most of my classmates, that's what they're going to do. They've never even heard of Austrian economics. I took a behavioral economics class last semester, and I wrote a paper trashing behavioral economics. I'm just like, you know, you guys are insane. You're, you're basically just saying that you're basically just saying that, you know, economic theory is wrong because you observe different patterns in some people and you can try to predict behavior. It's all bull crap. You can't predict the behavior. Now, we touched upon it before that in the, in the Trump age, it seems that political philosophy doesn't matter. I mean, Trump achieves his political goals through the tariff threats. It's all about uh, negotiation deals. And th then there's also like when Obama was president, ISIS seemed to be running rampant. Uh, but the perception is that Trump, he, he managed to crush ISIS, which goes against the, the non-interventionist view yeah, of... Total bullshit, yeah. How do you... We've talked about the, the Republican Party, how they've pretty much fallen into line be behind the Trump Republican Party and economic nationalism or nationalist conservatism. So how do you convince people that philosophy still matters, that you'd be 100% devoted to a, a certain political philosophy and believe that it's right all of the time? Uh, that's a really good question. And I think I'll just start by saying a lot of people end up at their conclusions or their views just by something that hits them close to home. So like for me, it was just the weed, you know, uh, for some people, I mean, sad to say I'm, I'm pro-life. Uh, I'm, I'm politically pro-choice, but I'm personally pro-life. But, you know, a woman goes out and gets an abortion and that's something close to home to her. And then, uh, you know, you have a conservative who they've been shooting their shooting their guns every single weekend with their grandfather for 20 years. And like that's personal to them. So there is that aspect where it's like, you know, there is a cultural aspect to everything, why people believe what they believe. You know, I, in general, I don't think leftists or rightists, I mean, I don't think they're a, in, intending to be evil. A lot of their policies lead to a lot of evil, but, you know, it is true that most people just want to be left alone. And if you're dying on the sidewalk, most people would help you. I mean, at least in America, like most people would help you. Um, it's just one of those things where like, no matter what country it is, it's kind of like in, in the classroom, like in an elementary school classroom, you have that one bad kid and like he just won't shut up, but it makes everybody look bad because everybody's pissed off. Everybody's just like, man, this kid won't let the class run. So it's just a few bad apples. And all it takes is a few bad apples, a few drug cartel members, whatever, to really paint this picture of how atrocious everything is and everything's about to blow up and we're about to go to war. Maybe we are, but the media is not reporting the truth. The media reports, I mean, I'm sure you understand this. The media fights to get to the story first. They often uh, report the facts incorrectly because they want to get there first, and it's on and on and on. We don't really know it's we, we don't really know it's true anymore. Uh, we suspect things that are true. We we see things happen day to day, but we don't really know. We don't really know. Uh, people in general, even libertarians, can be like this sometimes, just kind of living in our own bubble. And I've really, really gone out of my way to just like step outside of that bubble, travel, talk to different people. Like you know, instead of talking to my five thousand libertarian friends, I love you all. But uh, we need to spread the message because it's going in the reverse direction. Government's growing at an extremely fast rate. It's always been, but I mean, less is better than more. <laughs> you know, maybe I can just briefly describe why I'm an anarchist, and maybe this will strike a chord with you. You know, ultimately, all anarchists are saying is, "What is your ultimate goal?" So take like rape for example. It's really touchy, so it works for the example. Um, how much rape would you like to see in the world? Well, none. What kind, of, what kind of sick person would be like, you know, if we could just get it down to like three out of 10 people getting raped, that'd be pretty good. You know, we'll stop there. Like, no, like your, your, your goal is no rape. Your goal is no violence. Your goal is no plundering, no killing. So while I understand the minarchist viewpoint, because I certainly came from that area, I think the big problem with minarchism is you're aiming for three, uh, three functions of government. So you're aiming for some portion of government. And then inevitably, I mean, you know, what led to implied powers? The Constitution was laid out very clearly. I mean, the ratifying conventions, like, they really, really worked hard to, like, try to make it as clear as possible. Thou, uh, you know, it shall not be infringed. You hear that type of language a lot. It's just, well, what, I, don't, I don't really know what happened. Uh, well, things didn't work out like that, huh?
So the government figured out implied power. So, yeah, I can just uh, I, I read the law, I read the amendment or whatever, and I imply something out of it that I have all these powers now. So well, once they do that, there's no constitution left. And it's been like that for a long time. I think I agree that the worst thing libertarians can do is is be in their, their bubble. Like, I don't go to libertarian it's toxic. conferences. It's toxic like any bubble. Yeah, I don't go to libertarian conferences anymore. Basic, basically, like, they'll find at the beginning because, like, yeah, it's like being on school camp. There's all these people that agree with me if I can discuss yeah. all these nerdy topics. But I was going there year after year and liberty wasn't being achieved. And so I wondered... We, we keep coming back where we're in the same place and i also don't participate in those online liberty forums because it's just constant fights about what is the the true right. meaning of liberty like what's the libertarian reaction to this yeah. and so with the unshackled like i've moved out to you know outreaching to, to other right-wing mm. conservative nationalist uh, groups because it's clear to me that the libertarian moment it's not coming around again anytime soon and so you need to with the current state of politics at the moment it is very polarized you need to deal with that reality and see what liberty goals you can achieve within the existing political system which it is so polarized at the moment yeah i, I got you I, i'll give politicians the nicest benefit that i can give them most of them going into politics they probably had good intentions like man i see my community's messed up i want to go whether you're lower taxes or raise taxes like they truly believe that and then you get in there and then then a lobbyist comes up to you and offers you some money and then you, then you have to make a decision you know I, I could start taking money now but if i do that i do it forever or you stay principled now I, I don't know for sure i you know just look at ron paul on stage does he look like a guy that's like just dying for donations stuff like that he's just, he's just not like that he's just not like that but politicians in general i think you go in with good intentions like people go go in with a lot of things with good intentions and you get warped by it um take like adam kokesh for example i think he's a good guy but you know just really pay attention like it kind of got to his head and i think for most people it would get to your head and like you know sadly most of us aren't ron pauls we're waiting for our next ron paul it's what the liberty movement's waiting for yeah. uh it's not nick sarwick <laughs> um it could be us it could be me or you Tim, so we're basically at the stage now where the Antifa versus the, the free speech people, they basically could be libertarians on both sides. Like there's libertarians who are now sympathetic with Antifa and then you have yeah. libertarians who are on the side of what made up of the other group, the Patriot groups, the Proud Boys. You know, this is kind of like the leftist language. Like most people are actually anti-fascist, but we don't actually believe that they're fighting fascism. There's a funny meme article the other day. It's like, you know, Antifa member shatters mirror by trying to punch a Nazi. So <laughs> you get that joke. A lot of people like they, they fight for something like these black bloc people in Antifa, like they get in mass and they smash Starbucks for uh, out of all places and ATMs like it just it's totally crazy. And uh, when Andy No went on Joe Rogan, I was actually surprised how much Joe pushed back because Joe is pretty much like you listen to Joe Rogan, by the way, right? Occasionally. Occasionally, you know, who yeah, I know how his show works. Yeah, yeah. It, well, essentially, he was kind of like pressuring Andy, like, you know, Why'd you, why'd you go into this group of people and like get hit? Like, why don't you go with security guards? Um, and he, he was essentially at one point he was saying, look, um, these Antifa people, I'm a, Joe Rogan saying like, I'm on the left. I probably agree with them in a lot of things. Like I don't want to see right wing fascist dictatorships, but you know, Andy No just got beat up by a bunch of thugs. And he, Joe's like, oh, I, I agree with them on most issues. Like, you know, I, I'm sure Andy No is against fascism too. Like most people are actually against fascism. These white supremacists, there are uh, what was like a, a dozen of them in Tennessee. Like who, who knows? The funny thing was the Charlottesville. So there was one really, really big Charlottesville march a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, uh, know so, all about Charlottesville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the following year, guess how many people showed up? Yeah, I, 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 I kid you not. I read this article and I couldn't believe it. I was just like, "Are you kidding me?" The article said this: "Don't be fooled by the two dozen white supremacists that showed up. White supremacism is on the on the rise." And it's just like you could have worded that better or something like just be, just because there's two people there doesn't mean anything. like you know. <laughs> It's the same in Australia. People believe that the Nazis are, are coming back and there's yeah. attempts to reintroduce the, the, the white Australia policy and we have like secret racists uh, in, our, in, in our politics, all these absurd things. Well, they don't know any history, so they don't know that the National Socialists... Yeah, they, they weren't international socialists. They were national socialists, meaning they wanted socialism in one country. So I don't know if you're aware of the white supremacists... I think he considers himself a white supremacist, uh, Richard Spencer. He considers himself a white nationalist. He believes that yeah, the United yeah. States should be an, an ethno state. I make a distinction yeah. between white nationalism and, and white supremacy. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. I um just uh you know Richard Spencer he's tweeted out quotes of Marx saying like I look I agree with Marx. You know the only problem with Marx is like international socialism is international. Yeah, yeah, I'm people. aware of and, that. Yeah. I think it was Libby yeah, hanging out who said he should be chucked out of a helicopter. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, people just in general know very little history, know very little economics, know very little anything, don't care to know anything, like simplistic answers, like being on a higher moral ped pedestal than other people. So they get off on. And how do you get through that? I don't know. I, I think I try to trick people at first, like, yeah, you know, Bernie Sanders or whatever. And once they're listening, it's like, okay, now I'll lay some knowledge on you. It's probably not going to happen before. I mean, I, like I said, I go to a campus. It actually has like 40-something thousand students because it's UC Denver, but it's like three campuses. I talk to people all the time. Like people, they just know so little you can't even begin to talk with them because people don't know any like relevant details. They don't know like what happened here or here. They think something else happened here when it happened here. It's just you don't know anything. And obviously, I'm, I'm 27 in college. I, I should have graduated a long time ago, but you know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, they look really young to me. They sound really young to me. And man, I wonder, like, was I, was I that stupid? <laughs> I don't remember being that stupid. I remember, like, uh, uh, okay, I, I just got to tell you one last story. I don't know how much time we have left, but, you know, one, one good story to at least wrap up here. Uh, this is how I got into economics. So I told you I was a socialist uh, going into community college. Like I said, socialism is just kind of easy to gravitate towards because it feels good. You, know, you listen to all the people who are at, I think Thomas Sowell says, you know, I, I still believe the fundamental things. It's just I figured out there's a whole other way to do it. So my economics class, it was my very first one. My dad told me, you know, take an economics class, see how you like it. I loved it. Uh, near the end of the semester, there was a girl that sat in front of me. Her name was Molly Phelps. I'll never forget this. And she was supporting Obama the whole semester. I think even at that point, like I was still on the left. Like I was watching CNN every day driving my parents crazy. They, they hated what CNN. And, and um, she asked the teacher, why can't we just print more money? And, you know, the teacher was very kind, like that, you know, people don't know, they don't know. And he explained, you know, uh, money has value because it's scarce. And that alongside the little tidbits of things I heard from Ron Paul, it all started to come together. Like, oh, okay, this stuff's actually finite. Everything's finite. We're, we live in a scarce world. It's like the starting point of economics is scarcity. That turned me over the edge. That one instance turned me over the edge because her question was so dumb and he was so kind to her. I was just like, you know what? I think I went home that night and I found some like Walter Williams. I don't know if you know him. Yeah. Walter Williams was my dad's pro economics professor at George Mason. I showed my dad Walter Williams. He's like, oh yeah, I took a class with him. I'm like what? Small room. Oh, well, people like you and me, we realized when we became adults that hang on this, I, I wouldn't say it wasn't in my day, like social justice, it was just progressivism that the way to be caring and compassionate is to support government policies but we started to read and research ourselves that there, there doesn't seem to be that, that that type of degree of independent investigation in young people today we sound like old people now oh it's it's for many reasons obviously public schools are prisons if you didn't know that i mean not even just metaphorically like if you look at prisons like or excuse me, if you look at schools how they're designed they're literally designed after prisons, just like the bars and the windows, and like the structure, like the hallways and stuff. Like it's it's eerie, um, and and kids are put on like Ritalin and Adderall when they're like five years old. Imagine being on amphetamines from age five to eighteen. It's like you go into the adult world, um, you can't function without it. I mean, your your dopamine receptors are completely fried uh, at that point. Um, but we do this to kids. Here's here's a crazy fact. Try to try to fathom this. In Chicago, or I forget if it's Chicago or Detroit. Forgive me. It's one of those two. The adult illiteracy rate is like 48, 49%. It's like almost half of the adults. Yeah. Uh, I, th uh, I think it's in Detroit, Chicago. Oh, I mean, to an American, that just sounds insane. Because what are the ramifications of that? Can't fill out a job application. You can probably speak it just, you know, uh, really poorly. But you can't write, you can't sign your name, can't fill out a job application. Like the ramifications of that, you know, me and you, like, I'm, I'm sure we, we can both read. It, we, we can't imagine like picking up a piece of paper or a book and like not being able to like decode it instantly yeah. because, we, because we read. But, you know, just try to imagine what do you what do you do and with, with that li limited skill set? Crime. What else? It's all government. I, I blame the government for everything. I blame the government for cancer because they take half the GDP. They waste it. Probably would have funded cancer research. So I blame the government for everything. <laughs> and I feel comfortable. It makes me feel better. Like, you know, all our problems, government. <laughs> So 2020 is the, the next major election cycle in the, the United States, and obviously Trump will be the Republican candidate. Somebody 
awful will be the Democrat candidate, and it looks like somebody awful will be the, the Libertarian Party candidate. So there's not going to be much choice in terms of, well, if you're looking for a, a solid Libertarian to vote for president, but there's still plenty of other can be achieved for liberty at state, local level, yes. or just in, in, in the wider community as a whole. Yeah, I should have just prefaced that. I think I mentioned that I work with the Mises Caucus, so you can go to lpmisescaucus.com. And essentially, that's exactly what we try to do. We're not trying to get someone elected for president. It's not going to happen. I mentioned Ron Paul. Like, they just straight up took it. He was at the top of the poll, and they took his name out because they can't let him win. Can't happen. It's not going to happen. So what we – let me just give you one example. Um, here in Denver – and Michael Heiss was actually a part of this, getting this passed. So we have things that are called – what are those things called? Some type of ballot where, like, people can actually go out and vote on, like, a single issue and, like, get it passed. So in Denver – it was uh, psychedelic mushrooms, so we decriminalized those. And all that means is, like, they're supposedly barred from using resources to chase after people. I imagine if you have, like, 10 pounds of shrooms, like, they got to do something. But in general, like, yeah, psychedelic mushrooms, I mean, they can't really... So the, the reason that happened was because of a... I think it's called a ballot initiative. So take, like, any issue, like, you... I don't, ex I don't know how... I, I don't understand politics that much. Like, the, it's, it's, it's a big mess. It's a big web. But you, you know, get your bill that you want to get signed, whatever issue it is, and you get enough signatures, and that's how it passed in Denver. So there are very real things that me, you, and other people can do if we just go out and do it, that we can talk to people and get people on our side. And, you know, psychedelic mushrooms, it's a win. It sets a huge precedent because there, there is medical use for this stuff. It's just the truth. And we, we've known that for a long time. We've known that for, uh, with regard to cannabis. The government knows it too. They have, they have a lot to lose, believe me. Um, but there is very real things we can do just get out there and just try to try to do things locally. You're not going to you're not going to do anything crazy at the Libertarian Party in a federal level. It's not going to happen. And even if it did happen, they're going to do something. They're going to pull some string, make sure Gary doesn't get in the debate or whatever it is. They'll just make sure it doesn't happen. They will not let it happen. And I think that's hard for people to wrap their minds around. You live in a democracy like, you know, the people that are in power, like I chose them. It's like, you know, people are very deluded. They don't like in, Amer in America, for example. It's about like 20% of the U.S. Po the population that puts people in the power. If you just, you know, you take them. Uh, uh, the, 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 the same people. That's the thing. Like they, they give Congress a low approval rating, but just vote the same people back in. No matter who you vote for, you get John McCain. That's Wood's Law. Mm. Well, we've had a long chat. It's been a, it's been a fun chat. I think we've covered pretty much everything there is with state of libertarianism in the, in the, in the current year. It was good for me to go back to my my libertarian roots with, with somebody who's similar to me. I would encourage everyone to, to check yeah. out your, your, your podcast and make sure that you, know, you read and you continue to explore other, other philosophies because that's how you grow, not just politically, but as a, as a thinker and a person. Absolutely. Let me just uh, leave off with one little story here. It'll be one minute. Um, so at Mises University, there was this one guy there, and I don't know, I think he was actually with the Australian group. He's on the left, and he admitted he's on the uh, far left, whatever you want to call it. And I was listening to him debate people all week long. I mean, he just wasn't buying uh, capital uh, heterogeneity and stuff like that from the Austrian perspective. He just wasn't buying it. And I remember, I think it was uh, that Friday, the end of the week, I asked him, you know, you've been here a whole week. Just give me your honest opinion. What do you think? And this is what he said. He said, you know what? My mind's kind of blown because I've been challenged in so many different ways that I can't really tell you I agree with you, but man, I just have to go back and think about this stuff because I've never heard this before. And that's the thing, Tim. People just need to hear this stuff for the first time. Got to hear it for the first time. And that's, that's, that's the foot in the door. And then once people are like, oh, okay, this, this actually isn't so insane. Like, I, just don't kill me uh, and I won't kill you. It seems like a pretty good starting point. And then you just build from there and then it's just, everything's just so logical. Uh, that's one beautiful thing about libertarianism. Once you have the foundation, everything's very logical from there. So yeah, it's been a pleasure, Tim. And that's the show for today. This was a longer show than usual, but we certainly covered a lot of broad topics and ideas. It was a different type of show, so I hope you learned something new and were introduced to a different perspective. Stay tuned for more Waves episode, and don't forget to catch up on the latest Detonation episodes by my colleague Steel Archer on the Unshackled YouTube channel, and of course, episodes of The Uncuckables, our joint production with the XYZ and The Rational Rise on its dedicated YouTube channel, which live streams every Thursday at 8.30pm Melbourne time. 
Remember to counter the fake news and algorithm manipulations. Use DuckDuckGo.com for your search needs and InfoGalactic for your information needs. There is also free speech social media, which The Unshackled is on. We are on Gab.com slash The Unshackled. We are also on Minds.com slash The underscore Unshackled. We are also on MeWe.com slash P slash The Unshackled. We also have our growing Telegram channel on the popular encrypted messaging service at T.me slash The Unshackled. Remember, the best method of supporting our work here at The Unshackled to make sure we can reach as many people as possible and produce timely, relevant content is to support us financially. We are on patreon.com slash the unshackled and of course paypal.me slash the unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, theunshackled.net slash membership and our web donation form at theunshackled.net slash donate. We are also on subscribestar.com slash the unshackled and of course we have our merchandise for sale at theunshackled.net slash store. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.